So folks, old Donnie has been gagged again, and it's because of what he's been doing. So prosecutors and judges have made a big move to silence him. Again, in these cases that are running up one by one by one by one. But this time, it's somewhat different. It is connected, and we're going to talk about how, uh, excuse me, to these remarks that he makes in public, these violent, dangerous remarks. Of course, it's connected to that. They want to silence him, not because they want to take away his rights, but because his speech is not only corrosive to a fair trial, but it's led to people getting direct and indirect threats by the hundreds, if not thousands. Not just judges and powerful people, but regular folks just like you, who just unfortunately happen to be working on a trial connected to Trump or an investigation connected to him or maybe a witness or a jury member perspective or actual what have you. But it's also connected to the baseless arguments that he's been making and the conspiracies and what this demonstrates and hit the like and subscribe button guys. It helps me out a ton is that Donald Trump is being silenced by Jack and the judges and everybody that his arguments will not be tolerated any longer. The entire run of what I'm showing you is essential. Every clip, it combines his insanity and his danger and the judges putting a sock in his mouth figuratively and maybe even literally if he keeps up this stupid act. 2017, listening to his rhetoric, rhetoric about this department. So she is going up against years and years of anti-FBI, anti-Justice Department rhetoric. And it's not clear to me that there's anything the department can do at this point rhetorically. I mean, Joyce, that is an alarming proposition. It really is. You know, the deputy attorney general is someone who has served in a number of positions at DOJ. She was a line prosecutor. She ran the National Security Division. She had national security uh, uh, responsibilities in the White House during the Obama administration. And to see her feel the need, as Katie points out, to give an interview and to be willing to talk about threats to prosecutors and others is really alarming. It's a real red flag about the position Donald Trump has placed the country in. Yes, a big part of it has been his rhetoric that people have accepted um, that undercuts DOJ's integrity and the public's confidence in, in DOJ's integrity. But again, it goes back to our discussion earlier that Donald Trump is one voice. And if Donald Trump had said this, and if others in his party had said that's not the case, these are strong, solid democratic institutions that we can have confidence in, we would not be at the point that we're in today. So now we've got a deputy attorney general who's forced to reveal in the course of an interview that not one but three presidential candidates were the subject of serious threats. That there are now so many FBI agents and their families who have been threatened that there's a whole unit at the bureau that's committed to investigating those claims. This is a diversion of our resources from where they should be. And again, it lies at the feet of the former president. People in law enforcement are used to threats in the course of their work. What they're not used to is those threats from coming inside of the house. Right, and that is the critical point. Joyce Vance, Katie. Good evening from Los Angeles. I'm Jason Johnson in for Chris Hayes. We're waiting for the special counsel to respond to Donald Trump's wildly expansive claim of presidential immunity. Trump says he can't be prosecuted for January 6th because he was acquitted in his Senate impeachment trial. And he contends that he is, quote, absolute immunity from prosecution for his official acts as president. Jack Smith is expected to respond to those claims before the appeals court hears arguments on Trump's immunity claims on January 6th. All rulings on the January 6th case are currently on hold while that appeals process plays out. But that didn't stop the special counsel from filing a new motion with Judge Chanya Chutkin today, asking the court to not allow, quote, the defendant to turn the courtroom into a forum in which he propagates irrelevant disinformation and should reject his attempt to inject politics into this proceeding. Smith also wants the court to, quote, prohibit the defendant from introducing evidence, making arguments, or framing questions to advance a theory of selective or vindictive prosecution. Basically, special counsel wants to make sure Trump can't say this is Joe Biden's DOJ targeting him. And in response, Trump said Joe Biden's DOJ is targeting him. A rant by the ex-president called Jack Smith Crooked Joe Biden's errand boy. 
and a campaign email that went out just hours after the filing. Joining me now to discuss this is Ryan Riley, justice reporter for NBC News and author of Sedition Hunters, How January 6th Broke the Justice System. Ryan, thanks so much for joining me this evening. Look, I I have to start with this. So one part of the ruling we're waiting to hear, Jack Smith is basically laying out to Judge Chutkin, I don't want Trump to do the thing that we know that Trump is going to do. Um, Is this working the refs? Is this sort of saying, hey... Hey, you, you know that you know that Shaq is going to spend more than three seconds in the key. Is he working the refs here, or does he actually think that Judge Chutkin is going to be able to stop Trump from doing the thing that he always does? Hey, Jason. You know, I think that this has happened in case after case before with other January sixth defendants, where they've tried to bring up these sort of irrelevant. Uh, charges that aren't based in any fact or reality uh, about the FBI sort of setting up January 6th, uh, this notion that the FBI was controlling these figures behind the scenes who were directing these Trump supporters to do these terrible things. And, oh, what, lo and behold, I got I got caught and did something I wasn't uh, supposed to do. Um, and, you know, it I think it sort of speaks to the failure of the January 6th committee in some respects, because the January 6th committee didn't end up focusing a lot on the FBI failures that lead up to January, that led up to January. January 6th. And because of that, you have a lot of people who are willing to sort of accept these these bizarre conspiracy theories that all lean on this idea that the FBI is extremely competent and was pulling these things behind the scenes, when in reality, there were just a bunch of failures that led up to January 6th. And what happened is a bunch of Trump supporters thought that the election was stolen and stormed the Capitol. What happened is pretty simple, but they're trying to bring in all of these other facts around it and trying to, or other disinformation around it and trying to pretend like there's some grander conspiracy here that the FBI is all behind it. Having read through thousands of pages of FBI emails, I mean, it should be ridiculous on its face, but once you read these emails and see how many problems there were uh, there were from the FBI in the lead up of January 6th, it really starts to seem absolutely ridiculous. It's always interesting to me, Ryan, that, that anti-government conspiracy theorists think the government is terrible and competent until it suits their conspiracy theory, and then suddenly <laughs> they're all geniuses and all able to do everything that they want them to do. Uh, speaking of this, I think this conspiracy is key. In the Smith filing, he talks about this idea of undercover agents, and he says, look, we don't want to allow defendants to introduce evidence about undercover actors because that would inevitably lead to confusing many trials on collateral issues, such as the identities and intentions of the alleged undercover actors. For example, it may require the government to introduce evidence to show that people whom the defendant alleged were undercover actors were actually his vehement supporters. Ryan, you've written about this, and and I I find this to be one of the most critical elements of any prosecution about Trump on January 6th. How can we stop that from happening? How can you prove a negative? Uh, Because Trump supporters, as you sort of pointed out, have long pushed this theory that this is all this sort of Scooby-Doo conspiracy theory that if you pull off the mask, it was Antifa, but if you pull off the other mask, it's a Trump supporter, but that person is innocent. How do you stop that in court? Yeah, I mean, it's almost comical, but it does become this big distraction and this big time waster. Um, There's a Facebook page back in 2020. 2020- 20 and you know it's pro Trump meme after pro Trump meme, anti Biden meme after anti Biden meme, and then there's the fact, of course, that he tried to storm the Capitol after Donald Trump said you have to fight like hell. So it just happens time and time again where there's supposed to be this next mystery under the you know it's going to be under the next door, and they just fail over and over and over again. But at some point, it kind of gets into the you know a lot of people start to believe it, and a lot of of Trump supporters really do believe that this was some undercover Antifa operation. And so Donald Trump would, if he has the opportunity to, take advantage of that uh, to any extent that he could. Talk lawyer to lawyer here. Uh, What are you gleaning from what Jack Smith is basically saying in this latest filing about the evidence he has? We know we're in discovery now. I want to read a quote from the filing and let, let me know what you think about it. The government anticipates calling witnesses with knowledge of information protected by certain privileges, including the attorney client privilege and the speech or debate privilege. I don't know about you, but that last part, the speech and debate part, lets me know that there are particular witnesses that are going to show up on that list that this applies to, and that should worry Donald Trump. What do you read into that? Yes, yeah, same thing, Charles. You know, the speech or debate clause applies only to one class of people, and that is members of Congress and their staffs. And so to say that we want to preclude any argument that might confuse the jury involving the speech or debate clause says to me that Jack Smith is planning to call as witnesses 
either one or more members of Congress or staffers. Uh, that is very interesting testimony because we haven't really thought about before. We didn't see any of this before the January 6th committee. It may even be that somebody's cooperating, though not necessarily. He could put someone on a witness list, even though they are not uh, cooperative or part of a plea deal. But I do think it's very interesting because it does suggest that there's at least one member of Congress on Jack Smith's witness list. And it's important to remember that even as that might be the case, just because you appear on a witness list does not mean that the government has to call you. It means that they can. They're preserving their right. But nonetheless, this is pretty explosive language that we're seeing as part of this filing. Glenn, talk to me about the balance between what it is, for example, with Jack Smith's request that, look, we don't want this to be littered with different political speech when you're talking about, at its core, an offense and a fact pattern that inherently involves different degrees of politics, how is the court going to strike the appropriate balance in not necessarily making this a circus, as Jack Smith is trying to prevent, but also not potentially infringing upon whatever rights Donald Trump has, as anyone else would, as a criminal defendant? Yeah, Charles, it's a great question. This is an unusual trial, an unusual set of facts and circumstances. Now, motions in limine, just a fancy way to say, we're trying to limit the other side as to what they can and what they can't present by way of evidence, what they can and what they can't argue to the jury. Motions in limine like this are pretty routine. Um, ordinarily, the parties kind of know what they can and can't argue what's in bounds and what's out of bounds. That typically goes for prosecutors and defense attorneys. But it's pretty clear Jack Smith wants the defense team to be on notice of a whole laundry list of categories that he believes are out of bounds. And he wants Judge Chutkin to rule that they're out of bounds. You know, you can't ask a jury to decide issues or to decide guilt or innocence based on passion, based on prejudice, based on politics. I'll give you a simple example. Somebody can't put up a defense that says, well, I may have committed the crimes, but if I'm convicted and sent to prison, my children will become orphans. You know, that will play on the sympathies of the jurors, but it is absolutely an inappropriate argument to make. Jack Smith is trying to cut off all inappropriate arguments based on politics, based on uh, passion, based on immunity, based on selective prosecution. These are legal issues for the court to resolve. These are not the kind of things that jurors get to hear about. Glenn, I, I want to follow up with you there. 11,780. We've heard this over and over and over again, that number. With the call to Raffensperger, Donald Trump continues to push this notion of immunity. And he's using even the evidence in the call itself to Georgia State Secretary, uh, Secretary of State Raffensperger, where he asked him, I'm just, I just need to find 11,780 votes as evidence of, look, I, I, there, I did nothing wrong. Is this immunity argument, you just talked about appropriate arguments, is this immunity argument going anywhere? No, the immunity argument is going precisely nowhere. Judge Chutkin ruled that a president is not absolutely immune from being prosecuted for crimes he commits while in office. I anticipate the D.C. Federal Circuit Court of Appeals will rule exactly the same way. I think the most interesting question, Charles, is will the Supreme Court opt to review that issue, that that claim by Donald Trump when there really is no legal support for it? There's no statute, there's no precedent, and there's no constitutional provision that says a uh, a, a president can commit any and all crimes he wants with impunity. Frankly, if the Supreme Court buys into that, then the president could commit any number of crimes against the Supreme Court while in office to sort of marginalize their power. I don't see any of that happening.